As we continue moving towards uh, the conclusion of our study of Romans, and we undertake now chapter 15, it's helpful to notice that Paul's instructions to the believers of Rome shift, and they become more generalized in, in, in their nature. See, up to this point, all through this exceptionally long letter, Paul has switched back and forth between targeting the Gentile part of his audience, then next tar targeting the Jewish part. Now, starting in chapter 15, he is addressing all the believers of Rome without distinction. Now, we barely got started in Romans 15 last time, so I'm going to briefly review what we discussed. Much of chapter 14 involved a discussion about the weak in faith versus the strong in faith. And interestingly, in that chapter, Paul dealt with the issue of ritual purity, clean and unclean. This was the central focus of his definition of just who is weak and who is strong. And as an example, he drew attention to the issue of kosher eating. Now, it's fascinating that almost any commentary on Romans that one can find will make the remark that it must be the Jews who are the weak. It must be, therefore, that the Gentiles are the strong, because surely Paul is denouncing the Jewish custom of eating kosher and following, following the Levitical dietary laws. It's just an assumption. However, if one to is accept that, then the first verse of chapter 15 creates a problem because there, Paul the Jew counts himself as among the strong. And as I pointed out last time, Paul has used multiple opportunities to characterize himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees. A Jew who continues to believe in and follow the law scrupulously. Therefore, without doubt, he eats kosher. Many of the early church fathers, by the way, completely agree with that statement I just made. Completely agree with it. But some, such as Chrysostom, explain it away by saying that even though Paul did continue to follow the law of Moses, including eating kosher, he didn't really believe in it. He only did it so he could keep appearances as a deception of being a good Jew so he could evangelize other Jews. That's why he did it. Now, I find that ridiculous, if, if, if not offensive on its face. However, it does demonstrate the length that otherwise excellent commentators will at times go to in order to uphold a doctrine that they've decided to hold dear. So Paul, of course, ate kosher, and he also categorized himself as one of the strong in faith. However, the difference between the strong in faith and the weak in faith is not so much whether one eats kosher and the other doesn't, it is, as it is about how bothered and judgmental they are to others who don't eat like they do, whichever side of the fence you're on. Thus, the strong in faith, many of them, personally eating kosher and knowing it's God's command that we do, ought not to demean that believing brother, almost certainly a Gentile, who doesn't eat kosher. Nor should he demean the believing Jewish brother who goes overboard on trying to be nearly perfect in his diet by eating only vegetables and abstaining from meat altogether. Recall that generally speaking, it was ritually unclean meat 
That was always the danger in kosher eating. Vegetables and fruit had no prohibitions against them. And extreme mishandling had to happen in order to render them unclean. But there were a number of biblical prohibitions on various kinds of meats and how they were handled that made them legally edible or not. So the strong in faith, well, they were to be kind and understanding of the weak in faith, not the other way around. Therefore, says Paul in chapter 15, verse 1, the strong should bend towards the weak wherever possible in order to keep them in the fold. Now, let's talk about that for a moment. When a new believer comes to faith, they are in a most vulnerable position. They are operating on the barest of knowledge, and they have almost no experience with God at all. The Holy Spirit has wooed them into the kingdom of God, and the new believer may have little understanding of much of anything about the Lord and His ways. Therefore, it would not be too hard to convince them that their newfound zeal for God was maybe just a moment of psychological vulnerability. Or perhaps they were just mesmerized by the soaring message of salvation from an especially charismatic pastor. And they got caught up in the emotion of the crowd. Even more, to ask that new believer to immediately begin obeying a long laundry list of commandments, some of which are daunting or even nearly impossible, perhaps, in his current environment, is to risk him or her quickly just giving up and deciding that this is simply not doable for them to properly follow this new faith. It is the job of the strong to lovingly nurture and guide the weak and make allowances for their weaknesses. Not to be harsh, not to be demanding, not to browbeat them. A good, strong parent knows that you make the rules and boundaries as few and as simple and as clear as possible for a toddler. Only the essentials that guard their safety and acquaint them with the concept of obedience. Otherwise, you risk overwhelming them with things that they are not mature enough yet to do. They will certainly fail. And then they'll incur your wrath, and that is bound to damage your relationship. Let's reread chapter 15 so we have it fresh in our minds. Uh, let's reread Romans 15. Let's read all the chapter. If you've got a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 1419. 1419, Romans chapter 15. So, we who are strong have a duty to bear the weaknesses of those who are not strong, rather than please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor and act for his good, thus building him up. For even the Messiah didn't please himself, rather, as the Tanakh says, the insults of those insulting you fell on me. For everything written in the past was written to teach us, so that with the encouragement of the Tanakh, we might patiently hold on to our hope. And may God, the source of encouragement and patience, give you the same attitude among yourselves as the Messiah Yeshua said, as the Messiah the Yeshua had, so that with one accord and with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. So welcome each other, just as the Messiah has welcomed you into God's glory. For I say that the Messiah became a servant of the Jewish people in order to show God's truthfulness 
by making good his promises to the patriarchs and in order to show his mercy by causing the Gentiles to glorify God as it is written in the Tanakh. Because of this, I will acknowledge you among the Gentiles and sing praise to your name. And again it says, Gentiles, rejoice with his people. And again, praise Adonai, all Gentiles. Let all peoples praise him. And again, Yeshiao, Isaiah, says, The root of Yeshai, Jesse, will come. He who arises to rule Gentiles, Gentiles will put their hope in him. May God, the source of hope, fill you completely with joy and shalom as you continue trusting. So that by the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, you may overflow with hope. Now, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, well able to counsel each other. But on some points, I have written you quite boldly by way of reminding you about them because of the grace God has given to me to be a servant of the Messiah Yeshua for the Gentiles with the priestly duty of presenting the good news of God, so that the Gentiles may be an acceptable offering made holy by the Ruach HaKodesh. In union with the Messiah Yeshua, then I have reason to be proud of my service to God, for I will not dare speak of anything except what the Messiah has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by my words and deeds through the power of signs and miracles, through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Yerushalayim all the way to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the good news of the Messiah. I've always made it my ambition to proclaim the good news where the Messiah was not yet known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. But rather, as the Tanakh puts it, those who have not been told about him will see. Those who have not heard will understand. This is also why I have so often been prevented from visiting you. But now, since there is no longer a place in these regions that needs me, and since I have wanted for many years to come to you, I hope to see you as I pass through on my way to Spain and to have you help me travel there after I've enjoyed your company a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem with aid for God's people there. For Macedonia and Achaia thought it would be good to make some contribution to the poor among God's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it. But the fact is that they owe it to them. For if Gentiles have shared with the Jews in spiritual matters, then the Gentiles clearly have a duty to help the Jews in material matters. So when I have finished this task and made certain that they have received this fruit, I will leave for Spain and visit you on my way there. And I know that when I come to you, you will, it will be with the full measure of the Messiah's blessings. Now I urge you, brothers by our Lord Yeshua the Messiah and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God on my behalf that I will be rescued from the unbelievers in Judah and Judah and that my service for Jerusalem will be acceptable to God's people there. Then if it's God's will, I will come to you with joy and have a time of rest among you. Now may the God of Shalom be with you all. Amen. We have thoroughly discussed the first couple of verses of chapter 15, so let's move on to verse 3. There Paul uses a quote from Psalm 69.10 to validate his claim that even the Messiah, as an example of the strong, obviously, didn't please only himself. And the quote is, the insults of those insulting you fell on me. Now, so that we take this in the correct context, we readily know that the me in this verse is Christ. Who's the you? Who was having insults directed at him 
But Christ intervened and took those insults upon himself. It's much easier to see when we look at more of Psalm 69, a psalm of David. Let's look at look, that same psalm. But we'll start at verse 6. God, you know how foolish I am. My guilt is not hidden from you. Let those who put their hope in you, Adonai Elohim, Sebaot, not be put to shame through me. Let those who are seeking you, God of Israel, not be disgraced through me. For your sake I suffer insults. Shame covers my face. I am estranged from my brothers, an alien to my mother's children, because zeal for your house is eating me up and falling and uh, is eating me up, and on me are falling the insults of those insulting you. So it was David taking upon himself the insults and offenses that were made against his father in heaven. And Paul imputes the same now upon Christ. Thus, even the strongest man in faith who ever lived, Yeshua of Nazareth, didn't hesitate, Paul says, to be insulted for the sake of another person. Who was that other person? His father. His father in heaven. Thus, those who are strong in faith ought to bear the insults that are meant not only for God, but also for the weak. Verse 4 has caused some amount of heartburn among Christians over the centuries, but none more than in the past hundred years or so with the rise of what we could loosely call modern evangelical Christianity. Here Paul refers to everything written in the past in the Scriptures that was meant to give us, us here meaning believers, encouragement and patience in hope. See, the heartburn arises in that Paul, of course, only ever quotes the Old Testament. You do realize that, right? Paul only ever quotes the Old Testament, at least partly because there was no such thing as a New Testament in his era. And here he says bluntly that this is the source of a Christian's encouragement and hope, the Old Testament. But the evangelical church says that while it believes in the Old and New Testaments. In fact, the only relevant testament for Christians is the New. So this verse is rather at odds with that doctrine. Now, perhaps now is a good time to, re to repeat a hermeneutical principle that is important to the Hebrew roots approach to Bible study. It is that the Bible that in the Bible, Old and New Testaments, the term scriptures only ever refers to the Old Testament. The two, New Testament does not refer to itself as scripture. Thus, to read the Bible correctly, we must understand that any use we ever find in it of the term scriptures automatically means the Old Testament. So to properly analyze the Bible, we need to see it as consisting of two pieces, technically speaking, the Scriptures and the New Testament. And for Paul, the Scriptures, the Old Testament, that's Paul's Bible. That's the only Bible that existed in his day. Well, let's move along now to verses 5 and 6. Here Paul says that while the Scriptures represent the words of God, it is God himself who actually gives us the encouragement for patience of hope. And so it is, it is God that we are to look to in order that we can obtain this same attitude as our Messiah Yeshua of constantly wanting to glorify who? The Father in everything we do. See, this is directly connected to the issue of the strong in faith 
serving and protecting the weak. Therefore, in this context, Paul is telling the strong that it glorifies God the Father for us to bear insults made against Him and for us to bend to, in service to the weaker in faith and bear their burdens. What I'd like you to notice here is Paul's specific reference to God the Father. He says that our obtaining this attitude of Messiah glorifies the God and the Father of our Lord Yeshua. Not that it glorifies Yeshua. It's very interesting. Yeshua's goal in all the Gospels, as ours should be, is always to glorify His Father. He never sought glory for Himself. I only point this out because too much within modern Christianity, there is this belief that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are co-equal. That there is no hierarchy of authority. There's no order of importance. Yeshua says otherwise. Paul's every statement denies this possibility, as here, once again, he puts the Father above Yeshua. He puts the Father as the one to whom we are to direct our praise and glory. Now, I only say this because due to these populist doctrines of the 21st century evangelical Christianity, there is this subtle implication among believers that we are essentially replacing God the Father with God the Son. Since God the Father is the Old Testament God and God the Son is the New Testament God. And since the church is a New Testament church, then obviously we are to worship the New Testament God, Christ. Yet even Yeshua himself, the supposed New Testament God, disputes that when he directs us in exactly how we are to pray. He begins by saying this in Matthew 6, 9 through 10. You, therefore, this is Yeshua speaking, you, therefore, pray like this. How does that prayer start? Our Father in heaven. Hmm. May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as in heaven. Christ says we are to pray to the Father, not to Him. We are to endeavor to keep the Father's name holy, not His. And this isn't the first time Messiah Yeshua said something like this. In Matthew 12, we read this, verses 31 32. Because of this, again, this is Yeshua talking, I tell you that people will be forgiven any sin and blasphemy, but the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. That will not be forgiven. One can say something against the Son of Man himself and be forgiven. But whoever keeps on speaking against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Neither in the Olam Hazeh, that's the present world, nor in the Olam Hava, the world to come. This is your Savior speaking. See, I'm certainly not encouraging you to rashly say something against Christ or to diminish his authority or his high position as sitting at the Father's right hand carrying all the Father's authority. But clearly, for Yeshua, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit hold a place of preeminence above him. We need to keep this, keep this sort of thing in mind. Let us never stop praying in the name of Yeshua but we must always pray to the Father, exactly as He told us to do. The Old 
Testament God is the creator God, and he is the father of us all. And he remains as the New Testament God. Let us never try to relegate him to the dustbin of history, as is all too common in some of the more popular pockets of, modern, of the modern Western church. Now, verse 7 is essentially the conclusion that we are to draw from all that Paul has taught, starting with chapter 14, verse 1, and now proceeding up to this point in chapter 15. And the idea is that all believers are to welcome all other believers into their congregation of believers. Just as the Messiah has welcomed all of us. Whether weak in faith or strong in faith. Whether brand new in the faith or having held the faith for some years and thus hopefully more spiritually mature. Whether one regularly stumbles and falls or one is more devout and consistent in their faith, we all belong to the kingdom of heaven. Thanks to what Christ did for us. And we should not be judgmental towards our fellow believers or question their place in the kingdom of God. Verse 8 puts the spotlight on the reality that Yeshua is the Messiah of the Jews. Specifically says so. Whatever benefit Gentiles receive from Yeshua, it's because of the covenants God made with the Hebrew patriarchs. I want to quote to you from C.E.B. Cranfield's commentary on Romans that I, I'm not sure it can be improved upon as regards this particular verse. So I'm just going to quote it to you. Christ has become the servant of the Jewish people, the people of the circumcision. Inasmuch as he was born a Jew, of the seed of David, according to the flesh, lived almost all his life within the confines of Palestine, don't like that word, limiting his personal ministry almost exclusively to Jews, and both was in his earthly life and atoning death and also still is, as the exalted Lord, the Messiah of Israel. See, this fits hand in glove with what Paul had to say back in Romans 11 about Yeshua being the Messiah of Israel and that it was for the sake of saving all Israel that God has shown mercy to the Gentiles. Now he adds to that Yeshua's advent and his life's mission and the inclusion of Gentiles into the kingdom. And this was also in order to keep God's promises that he made to who? To Israel's patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Once again, as in Romans 11, we see Paul highlight the special priority, the special place of the Jews in God's eyes, so the Gentiles won't get the wrong idea of just where it is that we fit in God's plan. Well, what does this mean? It means that Christ is not the Gentile Messiah, because there is no such thing. It means that the Jews have already received their Messiah, even though the vast bulk of Jews are waiting for somebody else. If Christ is not the Messiah of the Jews, hear me. If Christ is not the Messiah of the Jews, if he is not the fulfillment of the covenant promises made to the Hebrew patriarchs, then Gentile Christians, we have no Messiah. Our faith is just foolishness. We are alive in our sins, dead to God. We are doomed. We are doomed to an eternity of torments and without hope. Key to properly understanding the New Testament is to internalize and realize that Christ was Jewish. You know, several years ago, 
I was giving a 10-part lecture at a church, and I began my talk with the words that Christ was and is a Jew. And an elderly man made a very sour-looking face at that remark. And he looked over to his wife, and he mouthed the words that I could plainly see, that's not true. She said something back. I don't know what she said. Anyway, he got up and he left. Never, he didn't come back. Well, the next week, as I was starting part two, to my surprise, the man returned. Before I could get started, he asked if he could speak to the group. I'm going, uh-oh. <clears throat> well, he stood up and he apologized. And he said that after being a church-going Christian for 50 years, he had never understood that Jesus was actually a Jew. He had never come to grips with the reality that his Savior was Jewish. And the initial thought of it made him angry, made him very uncomfortable. Understanding Yeshua in his Jewish context is what helps us to understand his actions, his immutable instructions to us. Well, in verse 9, Paul gives us a second reason. For God the Father making his son Yeshua a servant to the Jewish people. It was to demonstrate the depth of the Father's mercy, so that seeing it, it would cause Gentiles to seek what the Jews had received, and thus they would glorify the God of Israel. And even this had a reason behind it. It was to fulfill what had been prophesied in the Scriptures in the Old Testament. Paul paraphrases Psalm 18.50 which David took from 2 Samuel 22, 50, in order to make his case. In Psalm 18, 50, we read, So I give thanks to you, Adonai, among the nations. I sing praises to your name. Now, I realize the complete Jewish Bible uses the term nations in Psalms 18, but uses the term Gentiles in Romans 15, 9, if you're using a complete Jewish Bible. However, those two terms mean essentially the same thing. The word nations and the word Gentiles are the same word in Hebrew thought, goyim. This is because in the Bible, since early in the Torah, when through Abraham, God separated the world into two distinct categories of people, Hebrews and Gentiles, the term nations then evolved to automatically mean Gentile nations. This is because prior to the covenant God had made with Abraham, there was no need to specify Hebrews versus everyone else because there was only one unified category of people that existed throughout the entire planet. This passage from Psalm 18 is the first of four Old Testament quotations that Paul is going to use to support his case as it concerns the prophetic inclusion of Gentiles into the redemption equation. It is important to notice something that the Jewish believers would have caught on to quite quickly. He used quotes from the three recognized divisions of the Hebrew Bible as it was seen in his day. Quotes from the prophets, from the Torah, and from the writings. Actually, he went so far in his four quotes as to take one from the former prophets plus one from the latter prophets. One from the Torah, one from the writing. These are called Torah, Ketuvim, and Nevaim in Hebrew. Why did Paul do this? Was it just coincidence, an accident? No, it was to show conclusively how the entire Old Testament, all of the scriptures, 
pointed not only to Christ, but also to the eventual inclusion of Gentiles as a result of Yeshua's advent. Thus, Romans 15.10 is a passage taken from Deuteronomy 32. Romans 15.11 is a passage taken from Psalm 117. Romans 15.12 is taken from Isaiah 11. And as we see, they all prophesy the future inclusion of Gentiles into the congregation of God. So the conclusion is that the Jews of Rome should welcome Gentiles and not look down upon them as suspect or as unworthy or as not belonging or as second-class citizens or as the weak in faith just because they know so little about the Hebrew Bible the redemption history of Israel that begins in the Torah, nor even of the Hebrew fought, uh, prophets who foretold of Gentiles coming to worship the God of Israel. Rather, these Gentiles should be fully welcomed to join the Jewish synagogue congregations and prayer groups in the same spirit that Messiah Yeshua welcomed Jews and Gentiles alike to participate in the redemption that he brought to them, that he brought to us. Now, verse 13 is a rather typical Jewish-style blessing. It's a prayer kind of mixed with a wish. It begins by speaking of God as the God of hope. I'm going to remind you yet again that when Paul speaks of hope... He means it in terms of hope for resurrection from the dead. Little has unnerved and occupied the minds of humankind as our own death. Some cultures glorify death, others dread it. Some welcome death, others see it as unnatural and the result of just upsetting the gods. Some have elaborate death cults, the Egyptians. For others, it was simply just a mystery. So death rituals were pretty simple, like with the Hebrews. Thus, among Jews, what happened after death was mostly unknown. Life was and still remains the most important and pleasant part of human existence in the Jewish mindset. However, the concept of resurrection, reanimation, coming alive after death, was a hot topic in Paul's era. Thus, perhaps the most welcoming and attractive news that Paul brought along with the gospel of Messiah Yeshua was the hope of bodily resurrection after death. Paul teaches that this hope, hope of what? Hope of resurrection is available for anyone, Jew or Gentile, who puts their trust in Yeshua as Lord and Savior. However, the actual power to make this hope of resurrection a reality and not merely a comforting theory, well, that is contained in the power of God's Holy Spirit. It does not come from within us. It certainly doesn't come from other human beings. Once again, I'd like to demonstrate to you that as true and profound as that line of thought is, it was not an original thought of Paul or something that was even new to Jewish theology as a result of the advent of Christ. Redemption and an accompanying hope of resurrection by the power of God is not something that was born anew from Christianity. Listen to this excerpt taken from the Dead Sea Scrolls, written by the Essen Jewish community before the birth of Christ. This is taken from Scroll 1 QS. For to God belongs my justification and the perfection of my way and the uprightness of my heart 
That's in his hand. By his righteousness are my rebellions blotted out. For he has poured forth from the fount of his knowledge the light that enlightens me, and my eye has beheld his marvels, and the light of my heart pierces the mystery to come. From his wondrous mysteries is the light in my heart. In the everlasting being has my eye beheld wisdom, because knowledge is hidden from men, and the counsel of prudence from the sons of men. The fountain of righteousness, the reservoir of power, the dwelling place of glory are denied to the assembly of flesh, but God has given them as an everlasting possession to those whom he has chosen. He has granted them a share in the lot of the saints. He has united their assembly, the council of the community with the sons of heaven. And the assembly of the holy fabric shall belong to an eternal planting for all time to come. This was the essence way before Christ was ever born. But now in verse 14, Paul switches both his tone and he switches subjects. Now it's my opinion the purpose of these words is that after considering the forceful, Paul's always forceful, a forceful, the forceful thought and theology and impressive list of Holocaust religious rulings that Paul has now laid out for believers, Paul is now trying to kind of soften his tone a little bit. He fears he might have come off a little too heavy handed. Especially considering he didn't even start that congregation in Rome, yet he's declaring his personal authority over it. He does not want the believers of Rome to think that he thinks they are much in need of a good dressing down, or that they are ignorant. So, he says that he's convinced that the believers of the Roman congregation are full of goodness, and have a great deal of knowledge, and they're well able to teach one another proper doctrine. However, there are some things that Paul thought needed to be addressed as more of a reminder, probably, than as, a, than as teaching a new doctrine that they didn't know. Paul's statement goes a long way in destroying the rather standard contention of most Christian Bible commentators that Romans is essentially, the book of Romans is essentially a carefully crafted systematic theology for Christians, created from scratch by Paul. And he sent it in full to the believers of Rome, perhaps as a trial balloon, to see how well it might be received. Rather, it is clear that the subjects he covered were because of something he must have heard about the congregation in Rome, things he felt they needed to be reminded of. But by what right does Paul have to intervene in a congregation he has had no hand in creating? He says he does have that right. Because the grace of God uh, gave him, the grace that God gave him by of being a servant of the Messiah for Gentiles, because he has the priestly duty of presenting the good news so that Gentiles would be made an acceptable offering, made holy by the Holy Spirit, that gives him the right. Now, there's a lot here to discuss. Okay, first of all, Paul has taken quite seriously the commission he received on the road to Damascus by none other than the risen Christ himself. His commission was to be as an apostle to the Gentiles. But clearly, Paul was not the only Jew who was evangelizing Gentiles in the name of Yeshua. Even so, 
Paul took Christ's commission to mean that he was to be the chief evangelist. And he was to be the head of the spear in taking the gospel to the Gentile world. In fact, he was to be the authority over all Gentiles who came to faith. That's how he took it to me. So he felt that he had been given the authority to intervene virtually anywhere in the known world outside of the Holy Land, because in the Holy Land, that's where James, Jesus' brother, was the head of the congregation of believers. That consisted mostly, matter of fact, almost exclusively of Jews. So what does Paul mean then that it was his priestly duty to present the good news? Priestly duty. See, here's the thing to understand. According to the Torah, it was one of the prime duties and great honors of the Levite priests to keep and teach God's word to God's chosen people. It was their job. For centuries, they had failed at that. And instead, the office of priest had become politicized, and it was basically anymore just an occupation. It was meant to enrich oneself or merely to gain special privilege and social status. The synagogue was now where most actual Bible teaching took place, and it certainly was not priests who taught in the synagogues. However, in a sort of restoration of the Torah mindset, Paul describes the duty of preaching the gospel as being priestly in its fundamental nature, since the gospel is contained in the Word of God. Thus, it was always the priests who had been intended to teach people the gospel. So, in continuing this metaphor of temple and priest, Paul explains that those Gentiles who come to belief in Yeshua are as an offering made holy by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is then able to be presented to God. That is, all offerings, I want you to think about this now for a minute. Okay. All offerings made to God at the temple begin as ordinary and common things. But by setting them apart, by devoting them to God, this now makes them holy property. And thus, that's what makes them suitable for being presented to God. The Holy Spirit through Yeshua makes the Gentiles holy. And in this way, Gentiles become an acceptable offering to God. Now, further explaining himself to the receivers of his letter in Rome, in verses 17 and 18, Paul makes it clear that whatever he has said that might feel to the reader as a personal boast about his own accomplishments, it is not. Rather, he is proud or boasting of what Yeshua has done through him. As a modern-day application, it is not at all wrong to be proud of what God has done with Seed of Abraham Ministries and Torah class. Just as long as we understand, huh, we're just tools in God's toolbox. Everything good that has come from our efforts is Him operating through all of us as His willing vessels. That's it. It is God who merits the glory then, not us. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Him who gives me power. So in verse 19, Paul continues to explain that because of the power of God through him, he has spread the gospel to the far reaches, all the way from the center of Yehovah worship, 
in Jerusalem to Illyricum in the pagan Roman Empire. We have not seen in any of Paul's writings, interestingly, that he had been to the province of Illyricum. But that hardly means he didn't go there. I mean, the notion that all of Paul's letters have even survived, or that all of his writings are known to us, or that contained within those letters we do have and writings are the complete journals of everything he did, all the adventures, all the circumstances he encountered, and a detailed list of every place that he ever went. We can't be serious about that. That's not possible. Since Illyricum is north of Macedonia, and we know he was in the area of Macedonia, it's entirely probable that he made it as far as Illyricum. There's no reason to doubt him in this. The idea is simply to inform his readers of the furthest reaches of his ministry to the northwest. Well, we're going to pause here for today and finish up chapter 15 next time.